Brennan Chen, Roder a uh, uh, a year ago now eran eran cohex inflatol a gustaro a wallet slash a vala capum and parvasha could be an yo sagapa as that's all of them good fed and on big fed the big and muster for whole as you know I'd like to thank you very much for the uh, invitation uh, to speak here I think this is one of the most important issues that confronts us uh, I found Olam's talk earlier on very, very stimulating indeed, and I would like to get involved in that discussion, but by a superb act of self-restraint, <laughs> I hold it back, uh, basically because there is so much to say about that, that I wouldn't have time to concentrate on the things which I really want to concentrate on. So Olam, there's a date there for a future debate. <laughs> um, I think the, the one, two points I just want to make quickly about that. Um, when we talk about Labour, should Labour wait? We're not talking about the Labour Party, uh, which I think barely exists in any uh, serious uh, left-wing sense. We're talking about the Labour movement, trade unionist, organised workers. And the question really is, how do we bring those people into uh, active involvement in politics to affect the change? Because in class terms, there is no other class. As Connolly said, the Irish working class are the only incorruptible inheritors of the fight for Irish freedom. And the task we have, in a sense, is to put that forward, to go out and win the working class over in its organised forms, in the trade union movement, in community associations, in specific issue campaigns, in the women's movement, in the language movement, in all of these things together. And the role of a strong national party like Sinn Féin, one which in its fundamental understanding recognises that the social and national struggles are two sides of the same coin. That, I think, is the key role to bring all of that together. Not for anyone to believe we can affect a change in our country on our own, but that we can affect a change in our society if we can mobilise all the different elements to work in an honest, um, cooperative way with each other. But as I say, for me, the most important issue that we have is that question about national freedom, national independence. Everyone here, I think, would stand by the declaration in the proclamation that the Irish people have the right to the unfettered control of Irish destinies, to be sovereign and indefeasible. That we, the people of Ireland, no one else, no bloke with a Dardai or whatever his name is telling us how to pay for water, that we, the people of Ireland, make all these decisions. We make them good or bad as a free, independent people, as a dignified people. That, I think, is the fundamental starting point of this debate. So what is the EU? Well, we hear a lot of old guff about um, its great contribution to peace. Since it was formed, of course, the EU has been involved in wars in all over the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, uh, attempting to invade in Syria, been involved in wars in uh, Eastern Europe. So its definition of peace is a bit problematic uh, as a starting point. The issue of what the EU is about is actually spelled out very clearly in the original statements of Jean Monnet. You may have noticed half the universities in the country have a Jean, Jean Monnet professor of economics and a Jean Monnet uh, professor of law and another Jean Monnet professor of European studies, all of which are paid for by us, the taxpayers. Or as Vincent Brown, he doesn't like that phrase, uh, us, the citizens. Now, in the original formation, Robert Schumann, who was the French Foreign Minister at the time, made the point that the purpose of this coming together to form what became the economic community, the European economic community, was to lay the basis for the United States of Europe, the creation of a new state in Europe, which would be able to compete on the world stage. Uh, it was in alliance with the United States. In fact, the United States played a big role in encouraging the movement because it wanted to rearm Germany as part of its um, confrontation against the Soviet Union of the uh -huh. time. Um, Rearming Germany, as I remember as a child in England, was a very big issue in the 50s. Uh, people in, in England were very worried about the idea of a rearm Germany, but not half as worried as they were in France. So the deal effectively, and it's a fundamental deal that ran through the European Union uh, from its earlier stage, was in return for the rebuilding of German industry, and in return for giving German industry the opportunity of larger markets, 
in a peaceful manner through free trade, that the French farmers, who were the backbone of the French state, would be compensated by a protected agricultural policy. And that was the basis, but the aim and the purpose of the European Union always was the creation of a single European state which would be, as it were, one within which all of these uh, national groups would be subject. <coughs> now, Ireland at the time that we joined, uh, we joined for two reasons. I think we've, we've just um, gone through the uh, obituary of Ken Whitaker, a very important figure in Irish administrative history. Um, the point that should be recognised is that Whitaker came to the conclusion in the middle 50s when he was examining all this and producing the second programme of economic expansion that independence had failed. I mean, he says it absolutely clearly and bluntly that independence had failed. Ireland had not built up uh, a self sustainable um, industrialisation. We had huge levels of emigration, particularly in the 50s. And he said very clearly we would have been better off not to have bothered and to have stayed where we were. What we had to do, therefore, was to uh, look to an alternative method to do two things. One, to bring in an external force that would create uh, the capital necessary for development. And two, um, that we would um, approach a new relationship with Britain, which led to the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Area Agreement of 1965. That agreement essentially gave us a guaranteed access to the British market for Irish agricultural produce, a uh, preference for Irish agricultural preference within the British international food buying programme. That is of some significance, I think, in the terms of uh, the future uh, possibilities. Essentially, what happened in the time that 1973 came about was the sense that, you know, the state had, was a failure and that we had to look outside. Uh, why could we not build up an independent capitalism? Well, we came too late on the world historical stage for that to happen. The concentrations that were necessary could not be done by individuals. They needed the role of the state. In fact, Fianna Fáil's great contribution in the 30s was the development of state industries, uh, which actually acted as the focal point, which drew in all the other enterprises and allowed a space for economic activity to, to begin. The problem with that approach was it left untouched the central theme, finance. If you control the banks, you control the flow of credit, and we never ever took control of our banking system. Our currency remained the British currency, which meant that the interest rates, the exchange rates, um, if you like, the income that we earned internally as value internationally was always decided by others. We didn't decide that ourselves. It's that crucial weakness which in fact prevented um, the accumulation of capital because the capital na na naturally flowed out um, to where the banking system actually was, which was the city of London. It's in that context we see that we had a failure of an economic policy, uh, which had reached not so much a failed policy, but one which had reached the end of its possibilities under the constraints in which it was developed by the mass and Todd Andrews and people like that. And the recognition by Ken Whitaker that that could no longer sustain forward movement and instead the idea of independence would have to be abandoned and we'd have to accept a place within the system. So the would-be industrialists of the past became the facilitators of a new investment programme. They became the auctioneers, they became the uh, sociological advisors. They became the planners, they became the developers, they became the second tier of management for the multinationals which came in. And this is the social class which actually rules Ireland and has ruled Ireland ever since Whitaker's revolution uh, in the middle 50s. And that is the force which took us into the European Union, um, where people like Gareth Fitzgerald would say, the great achievement of 1916 uh, was that it gave us a seat at the European table. Not that anybody listened to what we had to say at that table, but according to Garrett, it was good to be there and have a, a hand. Now, the question about the European Union itself, of course it changed and developed. The uh, emphasis upon uh, economic and trade and cooperation, which was the main thrust of the 1973 position, as had been laid down by Schumann, began to evolve and develop. 
the single market um, came in, which was the establishment of a unitary regulatory system. We would not decide the regulations which pertain to, to business, to food production, to anything else. These would be determined outside, and a host of directors would decide all these questions, and we'd have just that small input from the beginning. Flowing from that, there was a recognition in the EU for, that for this to be effective and to actually do its task, unanimity had to be abandoned. And unanimity was progressively abandoned in the different treaties that emerged. Um, we had the, uh, then the process of uh, Maastricht with the, the single uh, market. We had the process then of uh, Nice, the beginnings of an idea about a European constitution, rejected incidentally in both France and the Netherlands, and also rejected initially here in Ireland. We were forced to vote again, but in France and the Netherlands they didn't bother with voting again because they didn't think their people could come up with the right answer. Um, fortunately, we knew our place and were able to do so. We then followed that up by the, the if you like, the fine-tuning of the European Constitution, the transition from a European community to a European Union with the uh, Lisbon Treaty. And then to give further effect to it, something which I will come back to in relation to Owen's talk, the Fiscal Compact. Because what the Fiscal Compact did, and of course Sinn Féin was amongst those forces, most active in opposing the Fiscal Compact. The Fiscal Compact Treaty allows the European Union to decide the terms of reference by which your uh, financial program is put together, the amount of borrowing that you are allowed, how you can spend that borrowing is also a factor. And so it is through the mechanisms of the Fiscal Compact, we heard all this during the water issue debate, this nonsense about borrowing uh, off balance sheet. Now that doesn't mean anything to anybody because if you borrow money, you borrow money and you have to pay it back. But if the sleight of hand which is created, it's the European Union which decides what is on balance sheet and what is off, what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So in other words, we see looking at this whole process um, a position in which the growing, growing strength of the centre of the European Union, the power of its unelected bodies like the European Commission, uh, the fact that the balance of voting, for example, in, in the European Council, Ireland now has 0.9% of the votes. Um, we may as well have 0% for all the effect of difference that makes. And let me explain what that difference is. If we look at Norway, Norway has 0% of the votes of the Council because it's not a member, it has associate members. But as a result of its not being a member and having associate membership, Norway has retained the ability to develop state industries. One of the most important of which, as we know, is stat oil, the state oil industry. All the profits made from Norwegians' uh, discovery of oil off its coast belong to the Norwegian state and are used for the Norwegian people. That is illegal. If we were, if Norway had been a full member of the European Union, that would not be possible because that would be a state aid. It would interfere with free competition. And we would therefore look at the disgraceful uh, procedures which have happened in relation to the gas discovery of the Corrib field. Not just the rough shot way the thing is rammed through uh, the local community, but the question of the ownership of it. That here is a huge wealth, and this will guarantee our supply, they tell us, in perpetuity. It will guarantee our supply if we pay the world market price for gas, which belongs to us at the beginning. Now, if anyone thinks that, that is a guarantee, that is a guarantee, in fact, of ripoff. These are not just arbitrary things. They are all natural consequences of what the European Union is and of the abandonment by successive Irish governments and the state over different periods of the whole idea of being an independent nation. Now, that process was slow. Nobody came up at the beginning and said, no, no, independence is old hat. Although there were people who threw that into the mix. I remember back, I think it was in the 60s, um, the late Brian Lenehan, the old fella, um, saying to the Welsh and Scots at the time, look, don't bother with independence. It was a complete mess for us. That's the wrong road for you to go. And that summed up the mentality of the ruling sections of Irish society, and that is still exactly 
and their disengagement, their refusal to engage in um, standing with our compatriots in the north of Ireland is directly related to that sense that really they've abandoned independence anyway and that's the last thing they wanted was to start it off. And so you notice from that period onwards also a change in the way that Irish statistics are put together. When they look at the famine, the population of Ireland in the famine time, well, most people would say 8 million. Not according to the official statistics nowadays, Ireland's population at that time was 6.5 million. Why? Because the Ireland, as they now conceive it, is a 26 county state. And that is, in a sense, the way in which all of these things link together. Their approach to everything is to write off part of the country and to write off the whole issue of independence. Now, the question is, we're faced with um, the needs, obviously, to develop our economy. Um, we still have the same fundamental problem uh, of a lack of accumulated capital within our society. And so the thrust of the policy is, as it has been since Whitaker's time, foreign direct investment. But if we look at the various analyses that have been made of that, uh, the Talesis report, which is a long time ago now, which spells out very clearly that um, foreign direct investment gives you a breathing space to build up your indigenous industry. Now the weakness of that, uh, the weakness of the position one time advanced by Michael Martin when he was Minister for Industrial Development, when he also criticised this over-reliance on foreign direct investment, the weakness of it is in fact that the state is the only institution which can gather all the capital that is needed together to make those changes. That is an action which is fundamentally outlawed under the European Union rules because it interferes with free competition. And remember the four great principles of the European Union as declared by Schumann and Monet back in the 1950s when it was all kicking off were the four freedoms as they call them. The freedom of the movement of capital. In other words, those who control capital can shift it wherever it will bring them the biggest profit not where a state can intervene in relation to the movement of capital to make sure that the social needs of people are met first, to uh, the freedom uh, of, of goods, that you can sell your goods without interference in a market and the extension of that, so you can't protect any developing industries or any industries which have a particular social value. So, for example, whereas Norway outside of the European Union is able to maintain complete and absolute control of its fisheries. We have no control whatsoever. Irish fishermen now, in what is probably uh, the biggest and richest fishing territory of the whole European Union, we have the lowest uh, percentage of catches of any of those uh, who are uh, involved in it. Most of the fish which is taken in our waters uh, is taken by French and Spanish and, and other uh, fishing fleets. These are not, again, these are not accidental things. They're a necessary consequence um, of the whole uh, way the process goes. Now, given that this is the reality, that we cannot accumulate the capital we need without a state involvement to protect it, which is illegal, given that we cannot um, meet the social needs that we have, and I come back to the issue of the fiscal compact, the whole issue of uh, a massive housing program does depend upon a choice, as Owen rightly said, you either borrow for it or you increase your amount of tax for it. Increasing the amount of tax is something which is done out of the current um, income that you have available. But the borrowing is something which in the town will repay itself because people will pay their, their rents, they will buy their houses, whatever the program put forward is. Borrowing is the way that in the 40s and 50s, 60s, 80s and so on, we actually carried out the huge programs um, such as Ballymon, Ballyfarmot, uh, Ballyfahan, uh, Nottnahini in Cork, Ballybarn in Galway and so on. We were able to give the Irish people a quality of housing far above anything that we'd had before in the slum conditions of the tenements or in the hovel cottages uh, which abounded in rural Ireland at that time. But to do that, you have to borrow the money effectively. And then you come up into the fact that the controls of it. It's not that the EU says, oh, that cannot be uh, borrowed for, but the overall package of borrowing 
is something which they determine has to be within the fiscal compact limits, and they are the ones who decide what borrowing is allowable within those limits. That is the terms of the fiscal compact. Now, if that is the um, situation in which we have, I just want to mention one slight other point, the question of competition, and it relates to these four freedoms. Uh, the freedom of labour. Freedom of labour is great <laughs> for employers who want to reduce wages. You bring people in, you offer them wages that are lower than the indigenous population get, you force wages down. You also generate the potential, as we've seen in the north of England, of a xenophobic response uh, to that problem. That doesn't mean to say that the problem is unreal or, or not a valid one. On the contrary, the problem of swathes of society whose um, living has been wiped out um, by austerity, by the decline of industries, and by the depression of wages, that's a very real problem. And the issue really is, who deals with that? Does the left wing, speaking for a progressive social and economic policy, deal with it? Or do we leave it to the right, to the Marine Le Pen, the Gerfields, the Donald Trumps, and, and the Nigel Farage's and all the rest of them? For me, the answer is simple. The left has to take on that responsibility and the leadership of that role and the organising of the response of working people to that situation. Now, we can give a particular example of how competition policy works in relation to this free movement. Um, the, we all know there's a ferry movement between Ireland and France, uh, the continental ferries um, which operates. Um, at one time, that was an Irish company. It then became, became a Latvian company. Uh, how was that done? Because the company was put into liquidation here, a new company was established in Latvia, which bought up all the assets at a very cheap price of the previous Irish company. The losses, because the Irish taxpayer had been a part owner of the company, uh, were met by the Irish state, and the profits were, were taken by uh, the management of Irish ferries and the new management who were exactly the same people. A so-called Latvian company which has exactly the same management and ownership people involved as when it was an Irish company. But the difference is the terms and conditions of employment are those which are laid down by Latvian law. Not those which are laid down by Irish law or even those which are laid down by French law because the ferry operates between those two countries. Those that are laid down by Latvian law, and you have a situation the boat comes into Rosslare, the Latvian workers on board the boat have to stay on the boat because they cannot afford to come and have somewhere to live and stay when the boat comes in to rest in port in Rosslare. That's not just peculiar, we have the same position as uh, big Swedish case, the Laval case, uh, again a Latvian company, uh, and where the European court ruled that the Swedes did not have the right to insist on the minimum labour law requirements of Swedish law in terms of wages, conditions of work, because the company was a Latvian company and under the EU competition rules, under the four pillars of freedom, no less, that company had the right to operate in Sweden just as it has the right to operate in Ireland. How do we change all this? Now this, I think, comes to the critical issue. Um, the fiscal compact was brought in as a result of a campaign. Uh, it had to be agreed by every single member state. Um, we remember during the campaign all the great threats, oh, Ireland can't be the ones to stop everybody else happening, because we were the only ones who had a referendum on it. Uh, we, we can't stand in the way of progress for everybody else. We'll have to stand by our partners in the same way that our partners stood by us over the banking crisis and the various other debt situations. Um, the point of the, the whole process was that we uh, accepted it. It became, because every single country accepted it, to change it requires a new treaty. You have to have unanimous <coughs> agreement of every member state to bring in a new treaty. Uh, at the moment, that's 27. When Britain leaves, it'll be 26. Now, let's try and think what that means to change any of the treaties, the fiscal compact or any of the others, to change the rules on competition, on state aid, on state development of the economy, on freedom, uh, to borrow for social purposes. 
any of those proposals requires the unanimous thing. Just think in the dark. If you go forward with a political program and you say every single party in this dial must agree with this program for it to come in. <laughs> Never. You know, Fine Gael to agree for a policy which is going to take money away from the big uh, farmers and from the professional classes. Fianna Fáil will agree to a policy which will cut out the profits of the builders and the speculators. Uh, Labour will agree to a policy which will cut out uh, the benefits of the uh, chances and the uh, rip-off merchants who dominate that party. It's not going to happen. We know that it is a physical impossibility uh, for that to happen. Equally, the idea that Germany will agree to abandon the fundamental wealth of Germany, because it is the only country in the EU which, as a result of all these things, actually operates a surplus in terms of its, um, its in income balance. So when people say to me, like Yanis uh, Varoufakis does, that we should um, reform the EU, I'm not against reforming the EU, it's just that it's impossible. It cannot be done, except in one condition. And that is if the whole EU was faced with the question of its unravelling. Now, uh, that for me is why uh, I thought Brexit was a good thing. Not that I have any particular graph or Nigel Farage. I don't really have a huge amount of graph for the people of England anyway, but that's just uh, my own racism. But um, the issue was it was a weakening of the European Union. It sold the opportunities to, um, to challenge and to force that through. There are other things happening. We may not like the politics particularly of the Visegrad group, you know, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia. But they too are saying there's too much central control, there's too much central interference, there needs to be a drawing back. The EU itself recognises this. Those of us who have the misfortune of relying upon Irish media for our information will not be aware of this. Um, but if the information is available, that is that there has been a position paper developed within the European Union itself, um, Juncker, I think, was the person who put it together, which listed five options of where the European Union goes now as a result of Brexit. One is that they do nothing, they stay as they are. Uh, generally recognised amongst most commentators that that's an impossibility, that this, the, the thing is gro groaning at the seams with the contradictions within it. The second one is that they would, if you like, scale back uh, the project to the key elements which are of importance to the big powers, that is particularly to Germany, um, on the, the single market, and that they would, uh, as it were, um, intensify the process of what they would do while getting rid of peripheral things which don't matter to the, the central project. Um, the third it would be those states who wanted to move full way through, full throttle, to the Schumann thing, and if necessary to do that on a two-tier process, or a different option to do that on a one-tier process where everybody moved in response to Brexit to um, full engagement. And the final one is that um, the EU would be scaled back completely to an economic and trading cooperation unit. Now, irrespective of our views on these things, that is clearly the option which is in the best interest of the Irish people because it gives us back control over our water, our fiscal policy, policies, our investment policies, all of these things, um, and we would then just have the benefits of being able to involve, as Norway already does as an associate member, access to the single market. Immigration isn't an issue for us, it's not an, a uh, an issue as far as I can tell in Norwegian politics, um, but the issue which they do have the right on is the right of the state to create jobs. And in our situation, where we still have thousands of people who are driven out in emigration, thousands of people who, uh, who now live in Australia, whose parents will barely ever see their grandchildren physically. I mean, that is back to the American wake days of the 19th century. And that has been wreaked upon us because we have a succession of spineless governments who have given in to all of these pressures and who, A, cannot conceive, you listen to it on RTE, they cannot conceive 
or the world not grow food in the same way. And so you have Enda Kenny prancing around in Brussels saying, um, well, they, they, I think they're now fully aware of our concerns. They are indeed fully aware of our concerns and they couldn't give a company down with them. We have to make sure that they do care about our demands because we can do something about them. Now, my view is that uh, Ireland will be much better off outside the EU, I argue that I think, but even if you don't accept that, and the former Irish ambassador to Canada, Ray Bassett, uh, made the point from a position of uh, being in favour of the Euro European Union, that the only way we could safeguard Ireland's interest in the Brexit situation was if we were uh, coherently and cogently to threaten that we would leave unless we got a deal that suits us. Then in other words, that we should negotiate directly with Britain the sort of arrangements that we would like to see, which would include issues of trade and, of course, of the issue of our own country, the, the way in which North and South will be maintained together and not driven apart through any uh, border system. Can we negotiate directly with um, Britain? But Enda Kenny says, we're part of Team Europe, so we can't do that. Funny, Spain can do it. The Spanish Prime Minister during the week issued a statement in which he said that uh, Spain intends, <laughs> not going to ask permission, Spain intends to have direct negotiations with Britain over the issue of Gibraltar and of Gibraltar's access to the European <laughs> Union through its access to Spain. And that they would have those direct negotiations with Britain good enough for Spain, for Jesus it should be good enough for us. Now the question then comes down to, uh, if you like, two things. What happens if we just sit where we are and Britain goes? What is the, the balance of the trade impact of all of this? In agriculture, for example, agricultural produce, food and so on, we send nearly 50% of our agricultural produce to Britain. Um, that's to the so-called mainland group. But that's where we send it. It's an absolutely critical market for Irish agricultural produce without any, any doubt. Britain has traditionally, as we know, one of the big problems we suffered in the 19th century was Ireland as a cheap food supply for an industrialising Britain with the consequent impoverishment of Ireland. Um, the purpose of the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement from 1965 was to guarantee some level above that. Britain is clearly going to be looking to buy food on the world market. We need, before it gets into that process, to guarantee the access of our food at a preferential rate, preferential tariff rate, before that comes into effect. The EU can either go along and give us the green light for that, or we should tell the EU to get stuffed, because that is absolutely essential for Irish agriculture. Far less significant for our economy and our social society than it once was, but still a very important single area uh, of vital concern, operating what 20, 25% of our overall economic development. So we have to protect that. What happens to um, the foreign direct investment if we were to take Bassett's advice and call the EU's bluff on it and we're forced to, to leave? The point has been made that if we actually look at what the foreign direct investment exports, the biggest section, two-thirds of their exports, are not to EU countries at all. They're to outside the EU. So the argument that they only come to Ireland because we are part of the EU is clearly untrue, since they come to Ireland to export outside of the EU, not to export within it. They come to Ireland because we have skills, um, there's a language issue. Unfortunately, they don't have to learn Irish, but they can speak some form of English. And that therefore, they're able to function here. They can um, uh, operate much more naturally within this environment. It's an attractive location. And then there's various issues relating to the uh, acquiescence of different trades unions in not uh, tackling um, the, the profit levels of these companies. But all of this is to say, not that foreign direct investment should be ended, but that we should have a policy as laid out in the latest report, what was that, 20, 30 years ago, of using the space of that to build up indigenous industries, and we have to see the state 
to do that. It's in that context then, I think, that we need to uh, re-examine it. Look at our trade figures. Um, exports of trading goods. Um, the European Union, excluding the UK, 39%. Very important. The world, including the, uh, the UK, 61%. The UK on its own, 14%. The United States and Canada, 25%. Uh, Canada and the United States and the UK, 39%. Um, the figures for the EU get much reduced under that. In terms of, of services, the figures are pretty much the same. 34% for the EU, 26 66% outside them. So we, do, we will, of course, suffer if our trade with Europe uh, is interfered with. But we will not suffer as badly as we will suffer critically in terms of agriculture if our trade with Britain is disrupted. Now, uh, Britain also needs allies in its situation. Um, we certainly want there to be, um, whether a seamless border is possible, we want there to be as amicable and as soft a British exit from the European Union as possible so that its impact upon us is, is weakened. But if we go in beforehand and declare to all the European negotiators, doesn't matter what you do, come what may, whatever you do, we're not going to leave. We're going to loyally tug our forelocks and toe the line. Then we will get a rotten deal, which is exactly what we will desire to get. The only way that you can get anything better is by showing that the revolutionary spirit uh, of Liam Mellows is alive and well. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever it may be, the only political party which has the internal world at all in dial electoral terms to do that is Sinn Féin and that's why I think there needs to be a very serious debate within Sinn Féin on all of these wider issues and a determination that Sinn Féin will stand above anything else for the principles of the proclamation, the, un the right of the Irish people to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. And one final point, when we talk about unity and we talk about independence, Let's remember that the purpose of unity is independence. And where we strike our balance is exactly as James Connolly struck it. We serve neither King nor Kaiser, but Ireland. And that, I think, is our position as it should be. Neither the European Union nor Britain, but an independent Irish state built upon the fighting, independent thinking principles of Leon Mellos and those other comrades who went before us. Thank you.